After the Battle of Elysia, Julius Caesar shows Vercingetorix no mercy and has him hauled away as a prisoner. Yet he does keep Vercingetorix alive. Vercingetorix will continue to be Caesar's prisoner for the next six years. Until finally, in 46 BC, in the midst of the Civil War, Vercingetorix gets to find out why he's been kept alive for so long. You see, Vercingetorix has been kept alive because he has a starring role to play in Caesar's triumph over Gaul. In Caesar's triumph, Vercingetorix is paraded through the streets of Rome as crowds boo and jeer him, proof of Caesar's conquest over the barbarians. And at the end of the triumph, Vercingetorix is ritually strangled to death. And while we can't be 100% sure, this execution likely took place in the Tullianum, the cistern prison near the Forum. The Tullianum may also have been where Vercingetorix spent his final days awaiting his execution. And if you want to get a look at what this prison, the Tullianum, looked like, I have posted a video of when I visited there on our Instagram and Facebook pages. It's essentially a dark, dank, miserable hole in the ground, and a terrible place to spend your final moments on Earth. As for the Battle of Elysia itself, it is almost certainly Caesar's greatest victory in war, and without a doubt his most famous. The fact that he and his veteran legions had been pushed to the edge of their limits in this battle just added to the prestige of the victory. They had looked the jaws of defeat in the eyes, and they had held their nerve. They had laid low the barbarians of Gaul, and in so doing, they had kept Rome safe. Or at least, that's the way a Roman of the time would have likely seen it. Remember, the Romans had a sort of pathological fear of northern barbarians, especially the Gauls. They were always afraid that some out-of-control barbaric tribe was going to burst through the Alps, sweep down on Rome, and sack and rape their city. After all, Gauls had sacked Rome once before, way back in 387 BC, over 330 years before the Battle of Elysia. Eventually, the Romans of 387 BC were forced to negotiate a sort of extortion payment, They agreed to pay the Gauls 1,000 pounds of gold for them to leave the city. And when the Romans and the Gauls began to weigh out the gold, the Romans complained that the scales the Gauls were using were cheating the Romans. The weights were heavier than what the Gauls claimed. And in response to this accusation, the Gallic leader threw his sword onto the weights, making them even more unfair for the Romans, and said to them, Woe to the vanquished! Meaning, you don't get to complain. You don't have rights. You've been vanquished. You were defeated. If you had any ability to do anything about us ripping you off, you wouldn't be paying us 1,000 pounds of gold to leave you alone. Woe to the vanquished. This whole episode was profoundly embarrassing to the proud and militaristic Romans. They never forgot the lesson given to them by this Gallic leader. Woe to the vanquished. In fact, Rome would even create an emergency fund in the case of a future Gallic invasion, and this fund was still in existence centuries later in the time of Julius Caesar. It's the same concept as an emergency fund we have today for natural disasters, but this one was for Gallic invasions. In fact, there was supposed to have been a public curse upon anyone who took the money out of this emergency fund for a purpose other than war with the Gauls. That's how seriously the Romans took the threat of Gallic invasions. So seeing Caesar smash a united Gallic host and subdue the wild Gauls once and for all was like exercising a demon for the collective Roman psyche. In acknowledgement of this, the Senate decrees 20 days of thanksgiving when they are informed of the victory at Elysia. This is yet another honor for Caesar to add to his ever-growing list of honors. So yes, 
As we said before, Elysia is Caesar's greatest military victory, his ultimate moment of triumph. Seven years of hard-fought wars had led up to that point. And yet, if we look closer, Elysia really comes about through failure, mistakes, and crisis. Caesar's strategy in Gaul was always one of divide and conquer, never let the tribes unite. Caesar constantly utilized clever diplomacy to splinter the tribes, to entice their leaders onto Rome's side, and to keep them at each other's throats. So when Vercingetorix unites nearly all of the tribes, and even close Roman allies begin defecting, that is a massive failure on the part of Caesar. His strategy was to keep Gaul divided. He utterly failed at that. But it's Caesar's reaction to this failure that makes him and other great leaders different from most people. Caesar doesn't lose confidence in his abilities and wonder if maybe he's not the right man for the job, or maybe he's just not good enough or not smart enough to do this job. He doesn't sit around beating himself up or wallowing in self-pity. Where others see a crisis and failure, Caesar sees opportunity. With all of his enemies united and out in the open, Caesar can finally crush them all in one blow. He can finally knock the spirit of resistance out of Gaul once and for all. Caesar turns his great failure into his greatest, most glittering success. And what I always find fascinating is that no one remembers the failure part. They only remember the victory at Elysia. It's one of the clearest demonstrations I know of the idea that you only truly fail when you give up. And if you refuse to give up, then every failure before your eventual victory only adds to the legend of your accomplishment. Now, despite Elysia being the greatest battle of the Gallic Wars and Contrary to popular myth, the Gallic Wars don't end after Elysia. The Gauls still have fight left in them. And if that surprises you, don't feel bad for not knowing this. Caesar himself frames Elysia as the penultimate battle of the Gallic Wars. And so that is the way it has been remembered in the popular consciousness. In fact, the books Caesar writes on the Gallic Wars end at Elysia almost like an ancient literary mic drop. Caesar wins the Battle of Elysia, writes his final book on the Gallic Wars, drops the mic, and walks off the stage. He doesn't bother to write about any of the events in the Gallic Wars that come after Elysia. Now, it may have been that he intended to write about these events at some point, but that the Ides of March got in the way, we'll never know for sure. But lucky for us, one of Caesar's legates in Gaul, Aulus Hirtius, took up the task of writing about the final year of the Gallic Wars for Caesar. And by the time Hirtius writes this final book, the Ides of March have come and gone, and Caesar is already dead. And it's funny, Hirtius writes a whole preface to the final and eighth book of the Gallic Wars, which he addresses or dedicates to Balbus Major, that is, Balbus Major as opposed to Balbus Minor. There's two of them, <laughs> uncle and nephew. And Balbus, meaning Balbus Major, was one of the men who tirelessly and loyally managed Caesar's affairs in Rome while Caesar was in Gaul. And in this preface, Hirtius makes it clear that he has been cajoled, or perhaps persistently encouraged, to write this book by Balbus, but Hirtius has been putting off the task for as long as he can. He even says... He's finally writing the book because he's beginning to worry that his refusals will be confused as being lazy, rather than a hesitancy to take on an extremely difficult task. Hertius then says he wants everyone to know how extremely reluctant he is to write this book in the hopes that this will absolve him from the charge of arrogance or folly for thinking that he can insert himself into Julius Caesar's writings. He lauds praises on Caesar's commentaries and Caesar's writing abilities, saying that there is general agreement that Caesar's commentaries are far superior to any others. He even says that Caesar's commentaries have achieved universal acclaim. And he goes on to say that even though everyone knows how well and faultlessly Caesar wrote, 
he himself knows how easily and swiftly Caesar completed the commentaries. Finally, after having said all of this, Hertius ends his preface on a humorous note. He writes, quote, Doubtless, as I'm amassing all these reasons and excuses to avoid being compared with Caesar, I'm subject to accusations of arrogance all the same on the grounds that I think anyone could consider me on a level with Caesar. Farewell. End quote. Perhaps picking up on a theme in Caesar's Gallic commentaries, Hertius then begins his own commentary by writing, All of Gaul is now conquered. In fact, Gaul was very much not conquered. Hertius talks about the Gauls hatching new plots in the same paragraph that he says, All of Gaul was conquered. But we've seen Caesar write the same thing throughout his commentaries when Gaul was, again, very much not conquered. So just quickly flipping through the commentaries I found, at least three different times Caesar claimed Gaul was pacified or that he ruled over a relatively calm Gaul when Gaul still had a lot of fight left in it. So in saying this, I can only imagine that Hertius is writing this as an ode to Caesar. But who knows? Now, we aren't going to cover this final year in Gaul in as much detail as as we have the rest of Gaul because Caesar didn't write the book and because it's after the climax of Elysia. So we're basically going to cover the highlights of this year. The winter after the Battle of Elysia, already there is rebellion and instability in Gaul. Caesar handles this by racing from tribe to tribe, showing up unexpectedly and stamping out resistance before it can gather strength. Fleeing from this assault, many of the Carnutes tribe are chased into fierce winter storms. Hertius says a large part of their population dies this way. Caesar combines this strategy with a policy of clemency and leniency on rebellious tribes who surrender. And this policy encourages many tribes to surrender who, had Caesar been less forgiving, would have felt that they had no choice but to keep on fighting against Rome. Now, the biggest threat of these rebellious tribes is the Belovaki in Belgica. The Belovaki had at first refused to join the relief army at Elysia altogether, stating that they would fight the Romans on their own terms, choosing how and when and where this war would happen rather than taking orders from Vercingetorix, a man who wasn't from their tribe. Only after Comius of the Atrobates, who had strong connections with the Belovaki, interceded, did they send a small force of 2,000 men to join the Gallic Relief Army at Elysia. This means that after Elysia, while the rest of the tribes have been shattered, the Belovaki army is still very much intact. And soon, a number of other tribes joined the Belovaki in this rebellion. This campaign against the Belovaki and their allies turns out to be far more difficult than Caesar had anticipated. And after initially setting out with just four legions, Caesar is forced to summon three more legions, plus a large force of cavalry from his ally tribes. And in the many daily skirmishes between the two sides during this campaign... Caesar's German cavalry again distinguished themselves. In chasing some Gauls they had routed, the Germans put so much fear into the Gauls that not only do the Gauls not stop running until they get back to their camp, but Hertius says some of the Gauls don't stop even then and keep on running right out of the Gallic camp, presumably running home. Despite this, not everything goes well for Caesar. And as news of his difficulties trickle back to Rome, wild rumors begin to fly around that Caesar is in dire straits. A friend of Marcus Tullius Cicero's, a man named Marcus Caelius Rufus, writes in a letter to Cicero at this time, quote, Regarding Caesar, there are lots of rumors whispered about him, none of them very good. According to one, his cavalry had been wiped out, but that one is certainly a fiction in my view. Another says that the 7th Legion has been badly mauled and that Caesar himself is surrounded in the territory of the Belovaki and is cut off from the rest of his army. However, nothing is actually known so far, and even these unconfirmed stories are not circulating widely, but told as an open secret amongst a clique. You know who they are. Anyway, Domitius, the man we call Ahenobarbus, puts his hand over his mouth before he speaks. End quote. 
Of course, the clique he is talking about is the Optimates, or the Boney, and uh, Domitius, as he calls him, or Hannibarbus, as we call him, is one of their member. And of course, this is all wishful thinking on their part. Eventually, Caesar receives some intelligence that Corius, the leader of the rebellion, has planned an ambush for one of Caesar's foraging parties. And with this knowledge, Caesar is able to turn Corius' trap into a trap of his own, inflicting a defeat on the Gauls. And at this surprise ambush of Corius's planned surprise ambush, most of Corius's men flee and are killed. But Corius himself, refusing to flee or surrender, dies fighting like a true Gallic warrior. After this, the Belovaki sue for peace and attempt to blame the whole war, the whole rebellion, on Corius. And Caesar basically rolls his eyes at this and says that he doubts very much that the entire war was due to one man, and how convenient to blame a dead man at that. Nevertheless, he is content to accept their surrender in exchange for hostages without any further punishment. And this policy of clemency works its magic yet again, and in the next few weeks, several more tribes surrender after seeing how lenient Caesar was on the Belovaki. The Belovaki being defeated, Caesar next takes some time to ravage the land of the Eberones, yet again. The Eberones, in case you've forgotten, were the tribe that had ambushed and destroyed Caesar's 14th legion. And their leader, Ambiorix, is still at large. That has to stick in Caesar's crawl. So, he sets his army loose on their territory again. And Hertius says Caesar set out to despoil Ambiorix's land of its citizens, buildings, and cattle so completely that Ambiorix would come to be hated by any of his people who might chance to have survived. And the Eberones, as far as we know, weren't even rebelling at the time. This is just a case of Caesar still being furious at what they had done to his rookie legion. And perhaps even more so, as Hertius points out, Caesar went after the Eberones again for the sake of his prestige, which I can't be certain, but I think that's a translation of Dignitas. One final rebellion then springs up in the southwest of Gaul. Some of Caesar's legates managed to pin the Gauls into a town called Uxladunum, which is modern-day Dordogne. And this siege is essentially a mini Elysia, but without the outer set of fortifications facing outwards. Uxladunum is located on a hill with sheer cliffs for sides. So Caesar's legates build a set of fortifications in a ring around this hill. Caesar learns of all of this and decides that even though the Gallic army in Uxladunum is small, he has to go in person. Hertius says that Caesar was aware that all of Gaul knew that his command would only last for one more campaign season, and that if they could just hold out, Caesar would be gone, and with him, Rome. So, Hertius says Caesar wanted to crush any belief among the Gauls that it was resolution rather than sufficient strength the Gauls lacked to resist the Romans. In other words, he wants to crush their spirits. He wants to end any belief they have that if they just keep fighting, eventually they'll win. Caesar wants to drive home to them that Rome is just too powerful to fight, and that waiting out his command is not an option. Now, on his way to Uxladunum, Caesar accepts the surrender of some more tribes, and Caesar, as is often the case, is intent on showing clemency to his defeated foes, but one of the tribes surrendering is the Carnutes. And this is the tribe that kicked off the entire Vercingetorix rebellion by massacring Roman citizens at Cenobon. At Caesar's command, the Carnutes hand over the leader of this rebellion, a man named Gutruater. And Caesar's army blames Gutruater for all the dangers and losses that they have suffered during the Great Rebellion, meaning the Vercingetorix Rebellion. So as far as Caesar's troops are concerned, Caesar's clemency be damned, this man needs to be punished harshly. In fact, they demand this of Caesar. So Caesar, against what Hertius calls the bias of his own inclination, has the man beaten to death and beheaded. This is an interesting episode because 
While Caesar mostly gets his way in showing clemency and mercy, increasingly his army will become fed up with this leniency, especially during the Civil War, and this is an early example of that frustration. Caesar then continues on his way to join his army at the siege of Uxaladunum, and when he arrives, it's a surprise to everyone, Roman and Gaul. Wasting no time, he surveys the siege and quickly comes to an understanding of where things sit. The city is surrounded by Roman ramparts, but is still holding out defiantly. And since the people of Uxaladunum have plenty of food, it doesn't seem likely to starve them out. So Caesar decides to try to cut off their water. At first, the Romans seem to have some success with this. But it soon becomes clear that the town has a natural spring just outside their town walls, so well within the Roman walls. Hertius says that, All the Romans were hopeful that they could cut the Gauls off from this spring, but that Caesar alone saw a way to make this happen. Caesar has his men build a 60-foot-high earthwork, or maybe a ramp, and on top of this, they build a 10-story tower. The goal of this is to make it so that this tower looks down on the spring, which is on the steep hill outside the town walls. This artificial high ground that the Romans build, this tower on top of this earthwork, allows the Romans to launch projectiles at the Gauls attempting to reach the spring. The Gauls continue to fight fiercely, despite many of them dying of thirst, until one day, the natural spring outside their city goes dry. Now, never had this spring dried up before, so the Gauls of Oxalodunum consider it as an act of the gods, and with no water left, they promptly surrender. In reality, Caesar had his men tunnel under the spring and diverted the water away from Uxalodunum. Now, Caesar feels that his leniency is at this point universally known, and so he feels no one can accuse him of cruelty if he deals harshly with the rebels to discourage future dissent. So he has the hands cut off of all the warriors who bared arms against him. These warriors are then set free as living warnings of the cost of rebelling against Rome. That winter, Caesar spends fostering good relations with the people of Belgica and Gaul in general. The last thing Caesar wants is another war to spring up as his term as proconsul comes to an end. And to this end, he makes sure to treat all of the tribes with respect, makes generous payments to their leaders, and make sure not to impose any new burdens on them. In essence, Caesar plays nice. This gentle treatment combined with Gaul being exhausted from so many defeats leads to peace, albeit peace as subjects of Rome. This peace continues into the next year of 50 BC, a year which sees no rebellions in Gaul whatsoever. That spring, free from active campaigns, Caesar makes a trip to northern Italy, which is part of his province of Cisalpine Gaul. Caesar is there on business we won't go into, but it's also the first opportunity ordinary Roman citizens and Italian allies alike have gotten to honor Caesar for his great victory over Vercingetorix. Hertius writes on this, quote, Caesar's arrival was greeted by all the communities and colonies with incredible respect and affection for he was visiting for the first time following the war against the whole of Gaul. In decorating gates, roads, and all the places Caesar was to pass through, nothing they could think of was left undone. All the people came with their children to see him. Animals were sacrificed everywhere. The marketplaces and temples were full of dining couches, as it were, in anticipation of the happiness of a triumph so long expected. Such was the splendid generosity of the richer people, and the eager enthusiasm of the more humble. End quote. What a picture Hertius paints there. People decorating every space Caesar's to pass through. Parties being thrown, and people bringing their children to see Julius Caesar, knowing that one day their children can tell their children that they saw the famous Julius Caesar, the greatest of the Romans. Though they may not have known that he was the greatest of the Romans back then. And that is one thing I like about Hertius' writing, is that we get stories like this. 
Caesar, if he was writing this, probably would have left a story like this untold as being too self-congratulatory or too self-aggrandizing. Hertius obviously doesn't have to worry about that because he isn't writing about himself. Not to say that Caesar didn't like self-aggrandizement, but he wouldn't do it in such an obvious way. Now, despite all of these honors and parties, true to form, Caesar speeds through all the districts in Cisalpine Gaul and then returns to his army. With the Gallic Wars now over and peace in Gaul, and I say peace in air quotes because it's peace dictated at the point of a Roman sword, let's talk about the legacy of Caesar's conquest in Gaul, starting with how it affected Caesar. Caesar spent nine years in Gaul, involved in almost constant warfare. In fact, he fought wars eight of those nine years, and some of those years had multiple campaigns within them. And at the end of those nine years, Caesar is left with an army of experienced veterans who will follow him to the underworld itself. He's become fabulously rich, and he's proven himself one of the greatest Roman generals of all time. He's covered himself in glory, and his dignitas and his ability as a commander are now only rivaled by Pompey Magnus. And while he did all of this, he wrote seven books on the Gallic Wars, considered to be masterpieces of Latin literature, even in their own day. He even found time to write a book on Latin grammar, and he relentlessly politicked in Gaul and in Rome via surrogates and letters. Caesar has lavished his newfound wealth on Rome with building projects, entertainments, interest-free loans, and even gifts of money to important citizens. Wealth Caesar made through selling slaves and plundering Gallic or Celtic shrines. Classicist Philip Freeman writes, quote, Caesar's personal wealth from the conquest of Gaul was so immense that he endowed magnificent temples from Spain to Asia, sent slaves and soldiers by the thousands to provincial kings throughout the Mediterranean, and loaned vast amounts of money to needy senators. He gathered so much Gaulish gold and tribute and booty that he sold it in Italy for half the usual price. End quote. As for Gaul itself, Caesar's conquest was so complete that for the next five centuries, Gaul will remain part of the Roman Empire. In 49 BC, Caesar will leave Gaul. Shortly after, most of his army will follow. But despite this departure, the Gauls don't immediately spring into rebellion. Not until 46 BC, a year in which Caesar is busy waging war in Africa, with the Belovaki rebel again. This rebellion is put down. And with this rebellion being the one exception, for the next decade after Caesar's departure, Gaul is pacified. I find it endlessly shocking that, after eight years of rebellion, the Gauls didn't rebel again the second Caesar pulled most of his troops away and Rome was distracted with a civil war. I guess that just goes to show how thoroughly Caesar had beaten the Gauls and how cleverly he had won the peace afterwards. In the coming centuries, through Roman rule, Gaul will acquire the benefits of Roman roads, sewers, aqueducts, running water, bathhouses, glass windows, and central heating, which also heated their floors. Though we should always keep in mind that many of these advancements would only have been available to the wealthy, not to the wider population. Gallic culture will be heavily influenced by Roman culture, and in this new hybrid culture, known today as Gallo-Roman culture, Latin will spread throughout Gaul, as will literacy. The practices of head-hunting and human sacrifice will end, and the Druids will be repressed. 100 years later, Gallic men will even become Roman senators. And eventually, Roman rule will even see Christianity spread to Gaul. Up to now, this all paints a relatively rosy picture. But if you've listened to the March of History up to this point, you know that all of this came at a devastating cost. Caesar will set the tribute of Gaul as 40 million sesterces per year. That is is a pitifully small number for such a large province. To put that into context, Caesar is supposed to have paid 100 million sesterces 
just for the land alone of his new forum in Rome. It doesn't include the cost of construction materials or of labor, just for the land for his new forum in Rome he paid $100 million, and the entire province of Gaul's tribute is set at $40 million sterces. And the reason this number is so small is likely that, after eight years of warfare, Gaul's economy, agriculture, material wealth, and yes, its people, have been devastated. To borrow from ancient Roman historian Tacitus, who himself was supposedly quoting an enemy of Rome, Caesar has created a desert and called it peace. Historian Ernst Badian writes about Caesar's conquest of Gaul, quote, Requisitions of food and punitive devastations completed a human, economic, and ecological disaster probably unequaled into the conquest of the Americas, end quote. Though, I might disagree once you factor in the Mongol invasions, but that's a tale for a different time. Now, we mentioned the devastation to the people of Gaul, so let's talk about the Gallic or Gaulish or Celtic people. All names you'll hear used, though most modern books I have say Gaulish. Plutarch claims that one million Gauls were killed during the Gallic Wars, and another million captured and sold into slavery. He also says more than 800 towns were stormed and 300 states subdued. A different ancient source, Velius Petrarchus, says 400,000 Gauls were killed and even more captured. And when he says captured, presumably they're made into slaves. Finally, our third ancient source, Pliny the Elder, combines the people killed in the Gallic Wars with those of Caesar's civil wars and puts the number at a surprisingly specific 1,192,000 people killed. Pliny then calls this feat a very great wrong against the human race and says he does not count it towards Caesar's credit, even though it was forced upon him. I think many might disagree with Pliny that Caesar was forced to kill all these people, though maybe you can make more of a case for that in the Civil War. As appalling as they are, the ancient numbers listed here are probably exaggerations, like we've always said of ancient numbers. And it's hard to imagine the Romans had any accurate way to track so many dead in ancient times. But even if the deaths and enslavements are half of what these ancient sources say, the human cost of these wars fought for riches, glory, and power is horrific. And there are modern historians who accuse Caesar of genocide in Gaul. And if we judge Caesar by modern standards, I'd say that's certainly true when talking about individual tribes rather than Gaul as a whole. For instance, one example that comes to mind as an act of genocide by modern standards is the war with the Eberones tribe. In that war, Caesar talks about the execution of a race of criminals. He also talks about wiping out their race and name as punishment for their crimes. That sounds a lot like genocide. And this is just one of many examples throughout the commentaries. The massacre of the Eusippides and the Tenctari is another example. However, all of this is contingent upon us judging Caesar and the Romans by standards that came about 2,000 years after they died. In my opinion, there's all sorts of problems with doing that. But we won't go into that now. At some point after the life of Julius Caesar, I plan to do a full-length episode with my thoughts on judging the past. But for now, what I will say is that context is key. And as I recently saw a historian put it, we must examine not only the actors, but the stage. And the stage Julius Caesar acted on, the stage he grew up in and which taught him his values, was a savage one. And with that, the Gallic Wars are over. In our next episode, the political horse trading will hit a frenzied pace in Rome as Caesar, Pompey, and the Optimates try to negotiate Caesar's relinquishment of his command and his return to Rome. Of course... Both sides have very different ideas on how that return will happen, and very quickly it becomes a game of brinksmanship with civil war as the stakes. Now, before we go, I'd like to give a shout out to our newest patron, Tony. Thank you, Tony, for contributing some of your hard-earned money to support the March of History, 
and welcome to our steadily growing Roman army. And if you don't know what I'm talking about with regards to a Roman army, head on over to our Patreon to see. The link is in our show notes. For any given tier of contribution, you as the contributor receive a military rank. Tony now has a rank in our army. And as you will see, I had a lot of fun writing the descriptions of each rank. I may have gotten carried away a little. So go check it out. At the very least, it will be good for some chuckles. But of course, I hope you will contribute. Also, if you prefer one-time payments and you enjoyed this episode, you can send a tip via PayPal or Venmo. The link for both of those is also in the show notes. A dollar show is all I ask, and it will do wonders for the podcast, though any amount you can afford, however small, is appreciated. And don't forget to leave the show a rating, and don't forget to share the March of History with just one person you think would enjoy it. It does wonders for growing the audience, and this is a way that if you can't afford to contribute to the March of History, you can contribute for free by either rating the show or sharing it with one person that you know. And finally, we have our end of episode quote. Quote, if your actions inspire others to dream more, learn more, do more, and become more, you are a leader. End quote. And that is a quote by John Quincy Adams. I thank you all for listening, and I will talk to you on the next episode of The March of History. History.